when you're ready. Okay. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to our service this morning. It's good to see you here in the house of the Lord. Our scripture reading from this morning comes from John chapter 15. And we're going to be looking at the, this wonderful chapter of the Lord's words to his disciples, starting with verse 10. If you obey my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have obeyed my Father's commands and remain in his love. I've told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. My command is this, love each other as I have loved you. That was the word of the Lord. Father, we thank you for this service, for this opportunity to come together as we come together to praise you, to sing, to listen to your word. We thank you for being with us. We thank you for walking with us every step of this journey. We thank you for your presence, for your power, your resurrection power that lives within us. Thank you for all that are here, and bless us as we praise you, we pray in Christ's name. Amen. If you'll pick up the papers on your seat, and pick up the one that says, Friend of God, and if you can stand with us, sing, we're going to sing, I am a friend of God.
for his work in our lives. And now we'll go to favorite hymn. And since I have to also preach this morning, I'm taking care of my voice. I need you to sing loud and full in this beautiful hymn, 554, It Is Well With My Soul. of it. But the verses were in there and he sang them well. Jesus paid it all. Thank you. 
that um, one of my children, I won't tell you which one, went to the second verse of that song and wanted to know why Jesus would change the leopard's spots. <laughs> and I know we always have that and I think of it, but if he wanted to, he could. Amen? <laughs> and before our prayer time, which pa um, Brother Jim's going to lead us in in just a moment, let's sing our prayer chorus, Lord, Lord let your light. Judy, if you look around, you'll find one close. <laughs> okay, good. Lord, let your light. be seated. We need to uh, remember our pastor Brian and, and Tom are over in, uh, Byron and Tom are over in Lake Placid this morning and uh, in that uh, group, I don't know if they have a meeting right now or not, probably. <laughs> but uh, so Leanna asked me to come in and uh, lead us in our prayer this morning. We want to remember, we you got your purple sheet that's renewed every week. Some things stay the same and some things change. And if you do have a prayer request, if you contact uh, Bunny here, they will end up on this purple sheet if we have room, right? <laughs> and we make room. And sometimes the print changes a little bit to make room for, for all of that. And uh, so remember them. We want to remember also that we look around and, and there's a lot of things we can complain about going on around us, right? With COVID and the, all the 
things in the government this way and that way, and people are unhappy, and people are happy, and people are all kinds of stuff. But we need to remember that God is still in charge, right? And we need to continue to pray for those that's in those positions that somehow God can touch them so his will is being, is being done. I have to believe God's will is going to get done anyway at the end, and uh, so we need to watch that. Uh, we need to pray for our teens as everybody's back in school and kids are there. And uh, we still have a couple of three great-grandchildren that's going to school down here in, in uh, Port St. Lucie. Most of you know them and uh, continue to pray for them. Uh, on your list, you'll find that uh, Jay's brother, Greg, has showed an interest in finding the Lord, and we need to pray that he'll keep going, right? And uh, he's able to... Uh, be able to uh, mentor his nephew, Jonathan. And there's uh, Bill Short in the house. I think that's related to the pastor, right? Yeah, and he still is uh, back in the hospital and awaiting some uh, assistance there, in the, waiting for an assistance in the facility. So we need to be in prayer for them. Be in prayer for Jay, continue. And uh, be in prayer for Debbie as she is caring for Jay. And uh, there's a lot of things there. And uh, Frank Foster, who does watch our, our uh, services online, uh, he had an operation that they took out a big chunk of his jaw because of cancer, and we need to pray that they can fix up what they need to do there and, and heal, healing for him. So and then there's lots of cancer going around to different people. So let's have a word of prayer. Our dear Heavenly Father, as we come before you this morning, we just uh, are in awe of who you are. You are such an awesome God that you, that you do care for us. And it's a wonder that uh, why you do, and we can declare that we are your friend, Lord, and that you have called us your friends. And we just uh, pray, Lord, that you would look at these items and we've spoken of and the rest that are on our sheet here, Lord, that we just pray that you would... Uh, Touch them the way that uh, give them comfort and peace and, and grace and all of these things. And that you would uh, be with uh, Sister Leanna as she brings the message this morning. And that uh, you would speak through her to us. And uh, we ask these things in Jesus' name. Now, I'm not going to leave yet. <laughs> I got to get up here, so I'm going to stay here for a while, though. Uh, not really. Uh, I did want to mention... The Sunday School lesson yesterday, if you haven't seen it yet, and, then, and if you watch it, you'll find at the end of that Sunday School lesson, I gave you a challenge. And that challenge is, the name of the lesson is, Blessed to be a Blessing. And it's the story of Abram when he was called. And he was called and blessed to be a blessing. And you realize that each one of you have been blessed to be somebody's blessing. And uh, I was, gave you a challenge at the end of that. This week, coming up, send out a no note of encouragement to somebody or make a phone call. You can have some of that uh, social distancing, distancing uh, fellowship on the phone. We had a phone call the other day from somebody we hadn't heard from from a long time. He used to go to church here. Uh, <laughs> she just escaped my mind here. Uh, huh? Anyway, I'll go on. But, but go ahead and uh, go ahead and continue uh, to do, do things. Reach out to each other. You know, it's easy to say that because of COVID, we can't, we can't do this, we can't do that. But there's things that we can do that does. Uh, reach out. Uh, it was Doreen <laughs> called us, and we had a nice conversation with Doreen after we hadn't seen her in a long time. She said she was thinking of us and decided she'd call us. So if God puts somebody on your mind, it was a good thing for us anyway. Now, in there also, we mentioned that it was uh, Pastor's Appreciation Month. And we should uh, honor pastors and uh, the things like that. 
And the pastor's not here. We, we paid for him to go away. <laughs> so we could have, we could have Leanna speak to us there. No, not, not really. We didn't pay for him to go away. But we did pay for his trip, right? Yeah. Right. So we do have a something for Leanna. <laughs> As our special pastor this morning and our pastor's wife. And oh, on the front here, we, we got a new decoration yes. we put up here for the, on there. And you can take that with you. Oh, well, thank you. Very that much. is uh, a, Very nice, a nice fall uh, <laughs> thing. So I hope it don't fall over on you. Oh, no. Okay. Okay. Thank you. thank you. Thank you. It's got corn in it, so I really hope it doesn't fall <laughs> in the car oh, on the way home. Thank you. Well, I will tell you that I have been called upon to be my husband's substitute more than once. <laughs> we have discovered a long time ago that uh, he cannot be in two places at once. He has tried, but we figured that only the Lord can do that. He cannot do it. So <laughs> we don't even try anymore. But there's times when suddenly he's been called away to somewhere else. Um, one time during the night he became critically ill and had to visit um, a hospital ER and it turned out to be okay but I he could not stand in the pulpit the next morning <clears throat> and there were times when on traveling on the road by Sunday evening he was extremely tired and if he had a commitment to preach he would say to me can you pull out something <laughs> and so I would speak on his behalf I am not a preacher, I'm more a Bible teacher, so excuse that, and I am still dealing with this. I thank you for your prayers, and I appreciate them. Mm. Our scripture this morning is from two places. If you're the kind of person who likes to keep your finger in your Bible or know where you're going, not only that uh, passage from Luke 15, but we're also going to be in Philippians. And when I'm called upon to speak on his behalf in a hurry, I often go to the first chapter of Philippians. It is the joy chapter, and I love it. But I also consider it the love chapter. One of the interesting things about the letters that Paul writes is that he knows who he's writing to, which others do too. I don't know who Theopolis was, but he was written to a couple of times. But Paul writes to all of his fellow ministers and the people that he loves. He gives them greetings, and at the end, he's always got a greeting for two or three people whose names I cannot pronounce. But apparently he could, and he even knew how to spell them. So, so he writes these letters, and they are meant for people to read. Now there's instructions in them, and sometimes there's these little finger-pointing, scolding things in his letters justly deserved, I'm sure. But for the most part, you feel his affection and his desire for God's will to come through in their lives. And I appreciate that so much about his writing. Now, you all know already that I'm a word Nazi. I was given that title when I um, did some editing of a, some book chapters for a friend of mine. <laughs> And if you are my friend on Facebook, and you are welcome to be, you will find that I'm always fussing about grammar and spelling and stuff. When you read Paul's letters, how many of you had to learn how to diagram a sentence in school? Okay, then you're older than dirt, just like me. And I can tell you that that has come in so handy, studying Paul's writings, because he writes long, several verses long passages that are one sentence. And he doesn't use all the grammar he should. So I have fun doing that. He also uses illustrations and examples in his writing, just like my husband does in his speaking. And then you have to get back to the point. And I have discovered I have the same issue, because I should not have said all of this. So let's get to the message for this morning. I'm going to read from Philippians chapter 1. And I'm going to read verses 3 through 11. So it's going to be a little bit of a long passage, but this is the word of the Lord. I thank my God every time I remember you. And you know what? I'm going to read it from another version I've got on my paper. Hold on just a minute. I thank my God upon every remembrance of you always in every prayer of mine, making requests for you all with joy for your fellowship in the gospel from the first day until now 
Being confident of this very thing, that he who began a good work in you will complete it until the day of Christ Jesus. Just as it is right for me to think this of you all, because I have you in my heart, inasmuch as both in my chains and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel, you are all partakers with me of grace. For God is my witness how greatly I long for you with the affection of Jesus Christ. And this I pray, that your love may abound more and more in knowledge and in discernment, that you may approve the things that are excellent, that you may be sincere and without offense until the day of Christ, being filled with all the fruits of righteousness, which are by Christ Jesus, to the glory and praise of God. Now, in case you didn't notice as I was reading that, Paul was a Southern Jew. Did you notice? Of course not, but I'm going to tell you. I don't know who translated this, but it's supposed to say y'all. I was born in Alabama, raised in Georgia, and I know what the scripture should say because my pastor always said y'all. And when I look at that, I think of what a wonderful, warm, warm feeling that is for him to say y'all. This is my, the last time I spoke to you, I left this at home. I was very upset with myself. But this is just saying, in case you can't read it back there, Sid. And this says amen. And I expect a, a sound from you when I turn to this site, okay? Then we'll get through the message well. Okay, no problem. It is a wonderful thing what Paul does in his letters. And when you look at that, He's telling us about his friends. So look at verse 5. He says he values them, and he, that word's not in there. But his friends are valuable to him because of their fellowship in the gospel. It's the gospel. And we know that that means that they knew Jesus Christ, that they understood. They had not met him. Paul had met him on that road. Where was he going? Thank you, because I'm a teacher, come on. And so he met him on the road, he knew who Jesus Christ was, and if you remember, he went over into Arabia for a couple of years after that, because he was being chased, they were gonna kill him, you know. And so he went over there, and during that time, he listened to the Lord, personally. We don't know if he had teachers there, Christian teachers. We are not told anything about that time. But if you read in Galatians, you'll see that's what he did. And when he came back, he went to all the places where he was hated and came with the testimony of Christ. Now that's tough. To go where you have persecuted Christians and to show up a Christian. That's what Paul did. Good man. Then, in verse 6, he said he was confident that God was working in their lives. Why? Because he knew that was what God did. He worked in people's lives. And you know, he said, until the day of Jesus Christ, which means the day that Christ returns. And they were expecting that at any moment. They really were. We should be too. Then in verse 8, it's because they were partakers with him of grace. Now, I look up words, word Nazi. I looked them up. Uh, the, the word partake is a verb. It means to eat or drink something. I don't think that's what Paul had in mind, but that's its main meaning. And the interesting thing is the example says she had partaken of a cheese sandwich and a cup of coffee. I don't know who the she was, but I like her already. And another meaning is that it's to join in an activity. In fact, it comes from Old English, which means to join or take part. It's more than taking part in Facebook. <laughs> it's more than joining a club. This word means to be a part of, and that's what Paul meant. And because they were partakers, if you look at verse 9, he says he longed for them with the affection of Christ. Jesus says to love one another as I have loved you. The affection that he has for us. We're going to look at that this morning. Then if you go back to verse 1, you'll see that he thinks about them, his memories of them, he remembers them with thanksgiving 
and with joy. And that turns into prayers. So go back down to verse 9. He asks that their love will abound more and more, and they will abound in knowledge and discernment. They will approve the things that are excellent. They'll be sincere till the day of Christ, without offense until the day of Christ, filled with fruits of righteousness, and their righteousness will be to the glory and praise of God. So I ask you a question. How do you pray for your friends? Paul gives us an example. He tells us how to pray for one another. Well, Leanna, she's got the flu or COVID or cancer. I need to pray for specifically. I need to pray for that. Paul says, ask that their love will abound more and more, that their love will abound in knowledge. And yes, you can pray for healing. That's acceptable too. James tells us that. But Paul gives us an example of how to pray for our friends. If you're praying for me, would you pray those things for me? I need those things, just like those Christians at Philippi needed them. And note the time periods in these verses, especially three through six. He says, I thank my God upon every remembrance of you. Every is time. If you think of me, say, Lord, bless her. Lord, shine your light on her. And then in verse 4, always in every prayer. Wow, always. Then he says in verse 5, from the first day until now, you have been involved in the gospel. First day till now. That's a time period. Jim said this morning he's been at this church since, they, since it was not here. That's not exactly what you said, but close probably from a long time. Whatever the time period is that you've known the Lord, that's a time period that you're fellowshipping in the gospel with the people around you. Then it, so he says at the la, on verse 6, he who began a good work in you will what? Complete it till when? The day, the day of Jesus Christ. That's a time period. That means when I accepted the Lord as a five-year-old child, he began working on me. He began working in my heart. Did I do everything perfectly? Some of you know better than that. <laughs> Others of you are learning. But he's still working on me. And we used to let children sing that song. I loved it when it came out. He's still working on me to make me what he wants me to be. What a neat song to sing. But he's not the only one. If you go to John 15... I'm going to flip my book, Bible pages over. We're going to read this in, um, uh, no, that's not what I want. I'm going to talk about his letters, in his letters. In John's letters, he calls his friends, my friends, but he calls them dear friends and dear children. Not only that, plus also, and he calls them little flock. And it used to, I used to think about that. And after we moved to New Zealand, we knew that a flock for them would most probably be a flock of sheep. And we learned a lot about sheep, and some of them have good characteristics, some do not. Sheep can wander. We've heard the story of finding the, the one that was missing from the 90 and 9. They seek greener pastures. Did you know sheep can disown their own lambs? A, a ewe can give birth to a lamb and will refuse it, will butt it away, not let it near her. She will destroy it. Oh, do little flocks do that? They can fight with one another. And if you want to do a nice little eye roll, I'll do one for you. They can also be pretty dumb. They have to have a shepherd to take care of them in some way in order to survive. But I think that John was thinking good thoughts when he called them little flock. So we're going to talk about friendships. And friendships can be tricky and frustrating and awkward, but they can also be satisfying and comfortable and some of the best things that we can do. And to have a friend, what do you have to be? A friend. So everything we say today about friends not only applies to the people you want in your life, but to what you want to be as well. 
Um, speaking of sheep, we lit, went to New Zealand in 1978. Biggest surprise to me ever. I never thought I would move or live outside the United States. I never thought I would visit outside the States. But in the early days of the Work and Witness program, my husband got involved, and he was on the first Work and Witness team from this district. It was not the best time for me. In fact, I didn't like it at all. And when he came home, he started talking about missions, and I was not happy with that thought. I was not sure I could do that, but then the Lord started to do some miracles, and I realized he re really was serious about Byron doing missions of some kind. The first thing he did was the Lord arranged for someone to show up at my house one day out of the blue and say, I'm paying for you to go on that work and witness trip with your husband. I said, I can't get out of work. I don't have any vacation time. She said, I'm taking care of that. Byron called my boss, a good cigar chewing but not smoking Baptist deacon. And he said, two weeks, she can have them unpaid leave. Then uh, the strangest thing happened. We were called to interview at two churches, good churches, as pastor, and the Lord closed the door very firmly on each one. Then Bill Porter called and said, I have a church in New Zealand that needs a pastor. And I heard the excitement in my husband's voice on the phone, and I went, Lord, okay. I can't tell you. I can't describe what I felt. It wasn't an exaltation, but it was a knowledge. I grew a little bit in wisdom and discernment that day as I said, yes, that's where we're supposed to go. We didn't know anyone in New Zealand, but we were accepted by wonderful, wonderful, warm people who are still my friends today on Facebook. And when we go back to visit that country on our way to or from seeing our daughter in Australia, there are big dinners held in churches where we've been so that we can visit everybody that's possible. It is the most blessed thing what happened in those two years there and then the five and a half years that came later. God was so good. And he gave me something I had not had before. He gave me a group of ladies who became my personal friends, who helped me take care of my daughters, who helped me find my way to shops, who corrected my English. Well, you can talk the same English to someone, but if they're from New Zealand or England or Australia, you still may have trouble communicating. And I did. And that's a story for another time. But they were kind and they were loving. And when we came back as mission director and district superintendent, the relationship just expanded and became closer. It was a blessed time for us. Then in 2014, Byron and I moved back to Pompano. Um, we had never lived there, but that had been part of his assignment as district superintendent here. We moved there, and um, uh, an interesting thing happened, and let me insert this. I recalculated last week, 31 moves, 29 homes, 21 cities, six states, five countries. 54 years of marriage. I was a month from being 20 years old when we got married. So you can figure out how old I was last month if you want to. So back to Pompano. One of my friends said to me, I have a ladies Bible study I'd like you to come to. I said, okay. Um, pastor's wife, okay. Well, it's different. Okay. So I showed up in January. She said, I want you to be there. I lead it, I teach it, but I need someone else who knows the scripture, who knows the church, because these ladies don't all know. And I said, okay. She called it the Tuesday Jesus Ladies, and we met together. This group was composed of ladies who were members of the church and some who did not, longtime Christians, ladies who were new and didn't even understand Christian fellowship, ladies who'd served others, and ladies who avoided doing anything more than they had to, ladies who were frightened and anxious, ladies who were addicted and trying desperately to hide it, ladies who needed listening ears and fellowship and kindness, ladies who knew the word, and ladies didn't know 
who did not know who the word was. So when I arrived at the door for the Bible study, the ladies were surprised. And I said, what? And one of them said, you're the first pastor's wife to attend. Let me just stop there, Bonnie. This was after you left. <laughs> A long time after you left. And I said, what? And they'd only been meeting for about 18 months to two years. So it's been close to eight years now that they've been a group, and I've been part of the group. And I've been in two different churches since then. <laughs> and I still go to Tuesday Tuesdays, ladies. This group did not know what to do with me because I was a pastor's wife. I was a former missionary. I was a former DS's wife. In fact, I was not only a DS's wife in general, I was a DS's wife of that district, this district. And they were very uncertain. And right away, Kathy began blending me into the church, bringing into this group, bringing me in, talking to me. And I found that while I was there, I could be myself. I was accepted by this group of ladies just as I am. There was no previous judgments. There were no assumptions. There were no questions. There were no uncertainties. No ulterior motives, no expectations, no ambitions. They, was, they just accepted me with unconditional love. And this, the, the years that I have been with them since, we have all grown in the Lord. We've learned more from his word and we've shared together. And just so you know, what happens in study stays in study. We talk about things that are important to us. We listen to the concerns of others. We do not judge. We help. We pray. And we have a group text, very similar to our group text here. And we keep in touch with one another, sharing when we need to. But there's another kind of friendship, and it's friendship with your spouse. And I'm not going to go into this too deeply. But I want to talk to you about my first few years as a district superintendent's wife. You take the meetings and the miles and the people that a pastor deals with a church in a church, then you multiply it by the number of churches on a district. We put 45 to 50,000 miles on a car every year just in southern Florida. In Arizona, it was more than that. Much bigger district included Nevada, included Las Vegas. And there's very strong churches there in Las Vegas. And you multiply that by the people whose names you have to remember and the places you've been. And going into a Cracker Barrel and three people greet you and you have no idea of their names, but you know that you know them and they go to a church somewhere on your district. And if they were in that church, you would know who they were, but they're not in their church, they're in Cracker Barrel. And you stop and visit and hope the Lord gives you wisdom and discernment on what to say. <laughs> and you spend time with them. I had just been diagnosed as a diabetic. And I'd been put on some new medication. Um, the travel, the meetings, the stuff that I was doing. I worked at night. We bought the conference center. I worked at the conference center and still traveled with my husband. And I became very ill. And I went to see a Jewish psychiatrist. I was sent to him by my Seventh-day Adventist physician. And he said, I just want you to talk to him. And he listened to me for two months, once a week. I made an hour one-way trip to visit him and to talk. And he was so good. I appreciated him. But I want to tell you the questions he asked me. Leanna, how do you value who you are and what you do? How does your husband value who you are and what you do? And this district thing you talk about, <laughs> how do they value you and what you do? What do you do to relax and how often? I went, I've heard that word. What fun thing do you do with your spouse to spend time together? And do you ever have a date night when you go eat a meal and you don't talk church and family? I said to Dr. Freed, I don't know how to do that. Then he said, how do you plan to spend your days after your retirement with your husband, just the two of you? And this was not the last one. He said, what friends do you have? 
What friends do you spend time with to laugh and share? I have to admit that at the very end of that whole long list, he looked at me and said, can your husband come see me too? <laughs> he felt like we were doing too much. And I had to reassure him that every day we asked the Lord to direct our time and our steps. And then as I left, the very last time I was there, he said, Leanna, I can't do anything more for you. And I said, I know. And I said to him, uh, he said to me, I don't normally see private patients. You came at the special request of your physician. And I said, I did. You have a beautiful office and you have some, some rooms and you have a receptionist. You don't see patients. What do you do? He said, I certify insanity cases for the courts. And I said, I came to the right place. <laughs> and he was wonderful. And there is an epilogue to that story. 17 years ago, I had a minor heart attack. I had a stent placed across two blockages in the Widowmaker. And my cardiologist told me in March that that 17-year-old stent is still doing its job. He said, and he's a Christian, Leanna, that's a miracle. And I said, thank you. I really believe it is. So Byron and I have lasted 54 years. So something worked. I'm not sure what, but something worked. And then I want to go into John very quickly. Just very quickly, John 15, because I'm going to read further on than what I read to you. Um, going to go to verse 13. Greater love has no one, this is one you know. Greater love has no one than this, that one lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. <clears throat> I no longer call you servants because a servant does not know his master's business. Instead, I have called you friends. You did not choose me, but I have chosen you. Then the, um, so that you will go and bear fruit, fruit that will last. Then the Father will give you whatever you ask in my name. And then he said it again, because you know the disciples were a little bit like those sheep that were dumb, that he had to say it twice, and sometimes he has to say it 10 times to me. He says, this is my command, love each other. I think he knew that there would be times when they would not agree. Times when they would quarrel, maybe, with one another. Times when they would be in different places and they needed one another. And he wanted them to know that first four-letter word was the most important word in that command. What was it? Love. 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 And that is where our friendship with Jesus starts. These were his friends. And guess what? These are some of his last words before his crucifixion. One of the commentators says, in these hours when the shadows hung all around him like a threatening storm, Jesus dared to speak of the first, for the first time of his joy. He could already feel the lift of victory before the final battle. And then the writer says, speaking of Jesus, who for the joy set before him, do you know the next word? Endured the cross. Then he despised the shame. And he's now taken his seat at the right hand of the throne of God. These are the words written by John, his BFF. Best friend forever because this is a disciple that Jesus loved, and he loved them all, we know that. That was the way John expressed it. Do you say to yourself every day, I am the disciple that Jesus loves? I challenge you every morning, I am the disciple that Jesus loves. Do you know that if John had not written his account of the life of Jesus from his viewpoint, we would not have, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. We would also not have this command. There's so much we would not have. The command is there, and it's true for any relationship. An employer, someone you go to school with, someone you spend time, the postman. I'm sorry, mailman. I was back in New Zealand for a minute, the postie. 
Anyone you come across, you see them as a potential friend. I, I have so many Facebook friends and I can tell you where I met them, how I know them, and what our relationship is. Because we have built friends wherever we have gone. Do you build friends? Are you a friend that builds friends wherever you go? The Bible tells us about it. Proverbs says a friend loves at all times. You know that one. And there's a friend who sticks closer than a or sister. I'm being politically correct. Here it is again. One more. As iron sharpens our iron, so one man sharpens another. An important prince. Oh, how many of you do your devotions every morning in Amos? You read Amos? I like Amos. He's the woe book. W-O-E. He's the woe book. But he said this, can two walk together except they be agreed? Ecclesiastes says two are better than if either of them falls, one can help the other one up. Two can defend themselves, and a cord of three strands is not easily broken. In the New Testament, Paul says, for scarcely will a righteous man, for a righteous man will one die. Perhaps for a good man, one would die. But God demonstrates his love for us in this, in what, yet in that while we were sinners, Christ died for us. Our Lord said it best, greater love has no man than this, that he lay down his life for his friends. And who's the greatest example of that? He gave his life for us. We are blessed. This past week, three men from this church met together online, read a scripture or two, and prayed together for this church, for you individually, for your needs. My husband, Pastor Tom, and Jim get together on Wednesday night and pray for the church. And my husband said something this week. He said, this church is a bond. The people here, any, any congregation that loves one another, there is a bond between them that is a friendship bond. And we are blessed despite COVID. I don't know, Jim, if you read my mind and knew what I was preaching on this morning, but we are blessed despite COVID despite other illnesses, despite the north-south <laughs> directions that we go, despite the fact that some can't come all the time, even with the huge church around us that seems to overpower us, the Spirit of God still lives in this building, and when we walk in the door, we bring the Spirit of Christ with us. And in that, we bring the affection of Christ. We bring the love that we have for one another. Paul knew that it was the affection Christ had for him, the affection Christ had for all of them, his disciples, and he shared it and he shared with them. He loved his friends. He loved us so much that he did not want to go to hell without us. He didn't want us to go to hell without him. When he went there after the cross, descended into hell. He went to prove his power over Hades and to let us know that he doesn't want to go to heaven without us either. He wants us to go with him there. There's a lot of sayings that the world has about friendships, but I'm, I'm not going to use it. I'm not going to read them to you today. What I'm going to say is, is sort of very important because the news would have us believe that Christians are an angry lot. They would have us have people see that we don't agree, that we argue, that we do things that they don't consider right. They don't believe we're being accepting when we're not tolerant. There's so much. And then I look at my Facebook and I see Christians going head to head. Same issues. Not agreeing. I see people who are my friends scolding other people who are my friends for their attitudes and their beliefs. There's a danger, and where does it come from? It comes from the enemy. The best way to destroy the church is to divide us, to keep us at odds with one another, to sneak in and make us judgmental. Paul says that we are to keep our shared partnership in the gospel, even when we're separated by isolation that we are to share the grace that we receive from our Lord with one another, 
We're to share the affection that we have with him because of his love for us. So if you face a difficult week, if you already know something's going to be difficult this week, or if unexpectedly you have a difficult day, or a situation arises that is difficult, I have a little bit of encouragement. Remember this, Jesus, for the joy set before him, endured, endured the cross and its shame, and is set before the right hand of God the Father. And he's waiting for us to join him there. Amen? I forgot to hold it up. Amen? Thank you, Father, for your love for us, for the great affection. Thank you for the sacrifice that brought us back to you, redeemed. Thank you for your love and your spirit. Bless us this week, we pray. Go now with God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit and his Son. Amen.